Hey guys, welcome back to the Film for Ads podcast, part two of the gas law conversation. And uh, Sam had Mike Brown on again to discuss some of the gas laws that you don't always hear about in their clinical application. I thought it was an excellent interview and there's a really good blog that that goes along with it. And so, uh, Sam, just before we get into it, I was listening and you were talking about how, you know, you got a patient that you're getting ready to intubate and you're doing, uh, you know, the, the nasal cannula, maybe the non rebreather, the BVM. And you're like, you know what, I'm not going to discriminate between who gets that and who doesn't because of uh, whether I think that there's some sort of shunting going on. Just elaborate a little bit more on that because I thought that was interesting. Yeah. So when you talk about whether a patient's going to diffuse oxygen or not, so we talked a little bit about fixed law, you know, the thickness of the membrane. And specifically on that part, fixed law says essentially if you have a really thick membrane, it's tough for gas to get through either way. And so let's say, for instance, that you have somebody that has, um, you know, you can think about that that membrane only as part of the alveoli and like between the alveoli and the capillary. But really, what's all the stuff it has to diffuse through? You could probably add fluid into that as well. Let's say the patient has really bad pulmonary edema. It's still part of that membrane. It's just not generally where we think of it. You know, it's it still has to diffuse through all that stuff. You just got to think about what is like the full stack of, of what they have to diffuse through. And when you look at the papers on apneic oxygenation, there is really no statistical benefit if the patient's got really bad pulmonary shunt. And the way that they'll look at that is, uh, does a patient have usually the quote unquote primary respiratory failure, which means that there's something wrong with the actual lung parenchyma, or there's something inside that alveoli that's causing there to be an issue with diffusion. They call that, you know, primary respiratory failure. And my thought behind that was, are we really going to look at these patients and say, I am or I am not going to perform this intervention based on what I believe right now is going on with the lungs? For me, it's such a simple airway adjunct that we can add by putting a nasal cannula on at, at a certain liter flow, whether that be whatever you're using, 15, 30, flush, I don't know, whatever it is that you're using. To me, it's, it's adding more oxygen. It's making it so that nitrogen isn't going to get in there during the attempt. If we, you do fail the attempt and you go back in, at least the airway is completely filled with oxygen when you re-add that pressure. So to me, it doesn't make any sense to try to differentiate those patients. You know, to me, it makes more sense just to have your regular routine and cognitively offload that and say, I am going to use it every time, even though I am aware that in these patients with pulmonary shunt, it, it may not have the benefit that I'm looking for. It's probably not going to be the saving grace where I can stay in the airway for 10 minutes and they won't desaturate because there is going to be a shunt that forms on the pulmonary side. And just for those of you who probably seen our dead space versus pulmonary shunt, it's a VQ mismatch. Pulmonary shunt is when you have a problem on the pulmonary side. Think, you know, the, the most basic example would be somebody with pulmonary edema. It's in the alveoli, prevents stuff from getting through. The other type of VQ mismatch would be the creation of dead space. That's where the alveoli is generally fine, but there's no blood flow on the other side to diffuse that into or carry that into the body. So I don't know. What do you think about that? No, I, I think that's a great point. There's been multiple studies that have showed and and before I get into this, I want to say that we're talking about the apneic period, right? The period where you're going in and yeah. intubating them, not really not the pre oxygenation period, mm -hmm. um, because there's really two ways of doing that, right? I mean, you have the you have the crowd that's putting the nasal cannula non rebreather on and saying, hey, you know, they're I'm going to try to get their pulse ox up that it's that's not going to work if you have physiological shunting, you need something to increase that surface area. Mm -hmm. And what I was going to say is that there's multiple studies that have showed that uh, you don't have any more risk of aspiration if you use the BVM. Uh, the aspiration events were less and there was a longer oxygenation or I should say a longer safe apneic period in those patients. They had a higher SpO2 uh, after induction. So I think that there is the uh, the signal that we probably should be looking at ventilating with the BVM, PEEP valve, nasal cannula under it. And then we're talking about the subset of patients that are going to be able to 
passively diffuse that oxygen during the apox period. And yeah, I totally agree. It doesn't make sense to be like, oh, you know what? I think they got boogers in their lungs. Let's not use it on this patient. Just do it. And if you have to go back in, maybe even with the BVM, you've increased some of that surface area. You take it off. Maybe you get a few more seconds. Who knows? But I, I totally agree. I thought it was a, uh, a great interview and I don't want to spoil like anything else. So should we just roll with it? Yeah, and uh, I just I mentioned at the end of the podcast too, but I am doing a class on this in the live section, and that's going to be on August eighteenth. For those of you who want to check it out, we'll be taking some of this, doing some more graphics and animations, and then doing some case studies and trying to kind of play a uh, name that gas law. So if you guys are interested in that, tune in on August eighteenth on the live classes. Awesome, man! Sounds good. Let's roll it. Well, Mike, welcome back to the podcast. Now, last time that we were wrapping up, you told me good luck when I was trying to find some clinical application for these other laws. So fix, grams, um, Daltons. But in talking about it, we came up with some really good stuff. So first of all, welcome back. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, that was that was a pretty deep dig to find the uh, clinical application of these, wasn't it? Yeah, I think we the got others, some good stuff. It's a little, stuff, little more straightforward. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, and two, like when you Google these things, the first things that come up is all the ones that we covered last time. And then these are like, I don't want to say they're they're not secondary, but the other laws hint at some stuff and they're all very interconnected, but these ones have some really specific applications. So let's hop right into the first one, which was yeah. fixed law and fixed law just for you guys can follow along inside of the blog. The pictures will help this out a ton, but fixed law, I always think thick and thick go together. So essentially what it says is that there's things that are good for gas diffusion and things that are bad for it. The things that are good for it is going to be a really thin membrane and a high concentration of gas on one side and a low low concentration on the other. So a big gradient between the two and a thin thin membrane. Opposite of that, if the membrane's really thick, that's going to be bad for diffusion. And then if there's barely any concentration gradient, so there's barely any let's just say oxygen on this side, and there's barely any oxygen on this side, there's not a big gradient there. And so that's those are the things that are going to be bad for that diffusion. Now, there's a lot of things that we can do to alter these things. And so, Mike, maybe you want to talk a little bit about that concentration gradient and then the thickness of the membrane. Yeah. Um, and thanks for leading into that, Sam. But uh, I think Fix Law really helps to uh, dig a little bit deeper and fully explain Henry's because they, they kind of play together, right? Mm -hmm. So, but fix speaks more to the speed that we're going to be able to move gases back and forth. So Henry's just says simply the uh, pressure above the gas as it's increased, it will move gases into solution. In this case, uh, you know, the pressure of the gas above solution is oxygen and uh, the alveolar capillary membrane with the uh, pulmonary circulation bringing blood by it is the fluid essentially. So Fix says that the higher the uh, the amount or the, the percentage or concentration of gas that we have above the membrane, we're going to have a faster diffusion or movement of gases through that membrane based on that gradient. So there's always, we're talking, uh, you know, transport without using energy. So it's always traveling down a concentration gradient. There has to be a gradient for flow. Um, but the greater that gradient is, the faster the flow is. And, uh, you know, I think that this uh, fix really makes sense to me. And I like your fix, fix uh, relationship. It really, it, it does help you remember what's going on. Because the other side of this, we can, we can increase FiO2 to a point or fraction of inspired oxygen, uh, but we can only give so much, right? And in the, uh, in the last episode, we talked about the uh, PEEP valve being kind of the second uh, O2 regulator or the ability to uh, have more pressure of a gas or amount of gas above the solution, but it does something else that's explained by fix. And that's the, it, uh, stretches out that, uh, that alveolar membrane. So now we know that membrane's thinner because it's, it, there's no genie down there just creating more membrane. Mm -hmm. If it's one size and peep holds it out farther or uh, pressure support or whatever it is, um, we're going to stretch that membrane and the membrane is going to thin as it, as it stretches. So by fixed principle or fixed law, we're then going to be able to move gas faster, or in this case, oxygen through that, uh, through that membrane. But there's more than one membrane there, right? That we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. That's kind of, I think what you were going to 
Yeah. Yeah. So I was thinking about, you know, we, we have one side of this equation and you said increase the oxygen, thin the membrane that goes right along with this fixed law thing. The other thing is that if, you know, let's say you have two alveoli and they're a little bit different size, you know, let's say you got a big alveoli over here at, you know, stretch to the max. And then you got a smaller one over here, that larger one, just because of the surface area, it's going to be able to diffuse more molecules through it just because it's, it's larger. There's just more space to do stuff. And so the alveoli is one side of it, but the other side of it is then the capillary. It's always an AC membrane, alveolar capillary membrane. And so when I looked at this, I was thinking, well, what about the other side? The other side is the capillary, right? And one of the really cool things is stuff like Inomax or Flolan, otherwise known as epiprestinol, or even uh, inhaled nitroglycerin or nebulized nitroglycerin now. All nitric oxide donors, either directly or it gets converted to it, and what that does is it, well, first of all, it's really cool because it's really specific where it's nebulized. And so it goes down the airway and it finds those alveoli that are already open. And so it's never creating a VQ mismatch. It's always VQ matching. And so what it does goes into that alveoli. We've already done the PEEP or you know, pressure support, whatever it is that we're doing to increase the size of the, uh, increase the size of the alveoli. That's thin the membrane. We've optimized our oxygen. The other part of the equation is increasing surface area on the other side of that alveoli, which is going to be our pulmonary circulation. And so these vasodilators allow more blood flow. And they engorge those. Technically, it's a capillary, but it's going to be going into the pulmonary vein. And that's going to, that pulmonary vein is going to go into the left side of the heart. And so it improves that VQ matching where, yeah, that's awesome. You know, we got a bunch of diffusion going through this alveoli now. Now let's work on the other side and get a, a matching amount of blood now that we've optimized the amount of gas and optimized our thickness of our membrane. So those things are really cool. Maybe becoming more commonplace in, in EMS and EM, we'll see because nebulized uh, nitroglycerin may have, may have some promise to it. Josh Farkas did a, a blog on that a while back, and I remember reading that thinking it was really cool because it's a nitric oxide donor. And so it's going to act very similar to epiprestinol or Inomax and stuff like that. The, with the added simplicity of just a small volume nebulizer. And so once that goes in, dilates those vessels, you're getting in, improved VQ matching. And that could be, that could be a really cool thing actually. Oh yeah. Yeah, for sure. And the other side of that, you know, we talked about there always needing to be that gradient. Not only does that increase flow, uh, you know, help make sure we're keeping those membranes as thin as possible to allow that diffusion to occur. It's continuing to bring by fresh blood. So mm -hmm. blood that needs more oxygen needs to offload CO2. So it's helping to maintain that gradient as long as we can do uh, what we need to do from the other side of that, from the lungs to be able to uh, ventilate and oxygenate the patient. So it, it really kind of brings together that other side of fix. Yeah. And, you know, the nice thing about those pulmonary uh, vasodilators is, you know, if the patient's on them and you're doing a transfer, you can just shut those off for a little bit, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, take them out to the truck and restart them. Oh, man. Yeah. So those things have a super short half-life. Like we're talking a couple couple minutes. And uh, in the last episode, we talked about my little nasal issue and I got some uh, some sinus squeeze from going up and probably from overusing some neosinephrine in, in my nose and that dilates that vessel right dilates that airway passage and so you, it's technically vasoconstricting but you got to kind of think about the size of the passageway the and with those things if you use too much neosinephrine spray you get rebound nasal constriction and it can be really bad and probably what happened to me while i got some air caught up there but the same thing happens with these pulmonary artery vasodilators in that if you discontinue them, they can get rebound vasoconstriction. And it's not as easy as just restarting the medication and reversing that because what can happen is they can get atelectasis right afterwards because the, the body will sense, hey, there's, you know, there's nothing going on here. Let's do some hypoxic vasoconstriction. They might get absorbed to beta atelectasis right away. Something bad might happen. And if there's no blood flow going there, it really won't be able to absorb that medication and just a bunch of badness ensues. So it's not like you can stop this medication. They get this really bad rebound vasoconstriction and then you just restart it and oh, good, you know, it worked right away and you know we're back to where we started. 
no, it, it may take a long time and they may, if they're that sick to be on pulmonary artery vasodilators, you might crash their saturations and it can be really bad. Um, and there have been, I don't know if you've ever heard from people that that's happened to, but I've heard a lot of cases of this. So you want to be really I, careful. It's one of those finicky medications where it's not like you accidentally shut off the pressors and you start them again. And oh, whew, man, you know, they, they bottomed out there for a second. But we're back. Um, it can have some serious consequences. So never stop a pulmonary artery vasodilator. Uh, always continue that during transport. They have to be weaned off that super slowly. And sometimes even when they get down to really low doses, sometimes the hospital still has problems getting them off those really low doses. So don't stop those things. So yeah, good point. So the other one that we were doing was, uh, was Graham's law, right? Yeah. And you sent me some stuff. So Graham's law, I guess let's go over it real quick. Graham's law is all about effusion and, and diffusion. So that's pretty much like the basis of this. And to talk about, you know, the difference between effusion and diffusion, um, diffusion is just, I use the, the example in the blog where you put a candle in the corner and of course that smell spreads throughout the whole room. Why does it do that? Particle collisions occur. And so basically when you have these particles in the air, they're bouncing off other little particles and eventually they, they spread everywhere because everything goes from a concentration that's high to a concentration that low that's low because it wants to obtain this equilibrium all the time right and so that's simple diffusion it doesn't really take any energy it's just things bouncing into each other well then if you talk about effusion what is effusion effusion is going through a small passageway and essentially what this talks about is the density of those particles or those molecules and so the denser something is that the bigger it is the, the more it weighs the slower it's going to effuse or defuse and if it's really light, it'll diffuse or effuse really quickly. So with a fusion, you have a, a little passageway and molecules are trying to get through it. And what's going to get through it the fastest? The lightest ones. Why? Because they're hitting each other and they're bouncing really quick. And so they have more chances of going through that opening. So that's kind of the, the down and dirty of this Graham's law is the weight of the of the molecule is inversely proportionate to its speed. So you got a really light molecule, diffuses or effuses really quick, heavy ones, not so much. So you had sent me some literature on some helium stuff, which was which was really cool. So why don't you touch on some of this uh, helium heliox type deal? Yeah. So um, you know, this Graham's law is all about density, right? That mm -hmm. uh that diffusion or effusion is um, equal to the square root of the density of the gas. So the less dense a gas is, the quicker it's going to be able to move through something. So helium is actually a really light gas. The other thing that's cool about helium is it's inert. So it's physiologically inert. It, it will not have any uh, detrimental effects to us uh, based upon breathing it. I mean, it offsets oxygen and other things, but we actually use it in diving uh, to offset nitrogen. So we talked in the, uh, in the first podcast how uh, nitrogen can become narcotic at depth based on increasing partial pressures because you get deeper so that that partial pressure of nitrogen increases. Well, we'll use helium to offset that uh, so we can replace some of that nitrogen with helium. But uh, in the dive industry, we, uh, we call helium a fast gas. So what that means is it's going to uh, pass into the tissues and pass back out of the tissues uh, to be circulated and eliminated a little bit quicker than, uh, than nitrogen that is more dense because of its, uh, because of its density. So uh, that's why it's also found some pretty cool medical uses um, for patients that are constricted or we're having issues with flow because we can maximize that flow through a different, uh, through a different size of an orifice based on its density. And that's what Graham's law helps us to, uh, to understand, uh, not only that diffusion and effusion, but that movement, uh, movement of gas and that that density, uh, makes a, makes a difference. Um, you know, so it's not all that out of the ordinary in the transport environment or in the hospital environment for us to find patients that are, um, you know, that are on some sort of heliox mixture. And uh, Sam put some references and things in there where uh, changes are actually made for regulators and things like that based upon 
the consideration that uh, that helium has a, a different density. And that's explained by this gas law. Something else that's, that's kind of cool uh, is the thermal conductivity of helium. Um, so some types of ventilators and other uh, machines use a thermal conductivity test to, uh, to determine flow. Um, now it's been the best, to the best of what I can find in uh, some research is uh, that Hamilton uses a differential pressure flow sensor. So uh, the pressure changes is how it, uh, how it calculates that flow. So it doesn't use the thermal conductivity, but some other uh, styles of ventilators would use that. So it's actually looking at a, a thermal change across, the, um, across that flow sensor. And this would need to be adjusted for helium because it's going to conduct heat differently. We notice that in the dive environment because uh, the, uh, the real uh, steadfast, tried and true divers that do a lot of deep stuff in cold water will uh, avoid using their back gas or the gas that they're breathing for most of the dive to inflate their dry suit because it's less dense. So it's going to allow uh, them to lose heat easier. Uh, that dry suit we have to inflate as we uh, descend and we wouldn't want to use helium for that. Uh, some, some divers will carry a, a small bottle, inflation bottle, uh, filled with argon or another, sometimes they just use air, but argon would be an, an example of a readily obtainable, um, very dense gas that would help better insulate that diver from their, from their environment. Yeah. I thought that those, those tank factors that we put in there, I've always thought that those are really interesting for an 80, 20 mixture, which obviously 80% helium, 20% oxygen. Cause you wouldn't want to go below about 20% oxygen. Right. So, um, you don't want to give them like a hypoxic gas, but the tank factor is I think 1.8. So that means that like, if you have your tank, so let's say it's an 80, 20 mixture in the tank and you're using a traditional, um, you're using a traditional regulator. When you set it to 10 liters per minute, it's it's 1.8 times that. So that's easy math. That's actually 18 liters per minute that you're getting. That's how fast that gas can flow through that regulator just because it's so light. And so that's a really good example of effusion happening really fast with that pressurized gas. And if it can flow through the regulator at 1.8 times speed, I mean, that's almost double, right? And so when you think about gas needing to enter into an asthmatic or exit out of an asthmatic, in theory, you could almost cut their, their expiratory time in half by using some of these heliox um, mixtures. Now, as you get less helium and more oxygen in there, you can go up to a 60, 40 mixture. That's not going to be quite as fast, but it still can cut some serious time off of how long it takes them to exhale. And as that really replaces a bunch of that nitrogen in there or or pure oxygen whatever they have in their lungs at the time they can really get some ease in getting the air in and getting the the air out which is which is pretty cool um so yeah the heliox and i put some those tank factors and stuff uh inside the inside the blog um talking about this whole effusion thing so that that tank factor is a is an effusion thing um, the, the way that I brought this out and I thought that there was some clinical application in the blog is with apneic oxygenation. And we were trying to find, uh, a blog that or not a blog, an article that was really old is from 1958. And it talked about apneic oxygenation back then. And they were doing it. It's so old that the uh the article was entitled apneic oxygenation in man because a lot of the studies up until that point were like there was some on on humans prior to that point but a lot of the apneic oxygenation stuff that they had done was on cats and dogs so this was oxy apneic oxygenation in man and you guys will have to take a look at this article in there it's really crazy they went into some really detailed stuff about um, hypertension caused by uh, CO2 accumulation. Um, they looked at the pH, they were taking pHs in most of the subjects, not, not all of them. Um, just a bunch of really cool stuff. And even in more recent article reviews, looking at apneic oxygenation, they talk about, you know, why do you, you know, why do we think that this works? You know, we're providing oxygen, you know, probably via nasal cannula, 
Um, in, in these older studies, they had an endotracheal tube in, which actually, you know, extended the amount of space that the, the air had to travel or the, the oxygen had to travel. But as far as effusion goes, I, I used a picture of this, my new, um, my new little model right here. And if you're going through a tight space, and so you have, you know, compartment one, compartment two, compartment one would kind of be anything above this glottic opening and compartment two would be below this glottic opening. So there's a bunch of stuff that happens that causes this oxygen to want to diffuse through here. And it's not just simple like diffusion or effusion when it goes through. There's a bunch of stuff that's happening. One is that your alveoli are actually absorbing that oxygen. And so a more recent literature review that I was looking at thinks that you absorb about 250 milliliters of oxygen per minute. And so that's actually creating a tiny bit of a sub atmospheric pressure inside those alveoli. So you're constantly sucking that oxygen into your body, which makes things want to come from the top down to the bottom. The other thing is that if you have a really turbulent flow, if you have a really turbulent flow going down the nose, and I don't know if you've ever put yourself on, you know, apneic oxygenation flows and <laughs> done this with some trainees in the station, but you turn that up to 15, it's like, yeah. You know, okay, yeah, I can feel it back there for sure. I can feel it in my throat. When you turn that thing up to 30 or our flow, our Thorpe tube goes up to a flush of 90. You can't even keep it on. It's like it's like having a jet engine on your glottic opening. So that's a lot of turbulent flow. And this one article review that I linked in the blog, it described that turbulent flow essentially like cyclones. Uh, and it, it used a cool illustration of gears. And it's, it's like turning a big gear and then that turns a smaller gear and a smaller gear and a smaller gear and a smaller gear all the way until you get down to the alveoli where that gas exchange is occurring. It's a turbulent flow. And the other thing that is cool about this effusion um, and talking about these different molecules that are smashing into each other. The other thing is that on one side of that glottic opening, there's a bunch of because of that turbulent flow, you're having particle collisions on this side. And so that gives it more and more chance to want to bounce through the glottic opening. So there's several mechanisms about why this oxygen is actually making it down. And I think it's hilarious because you'll still have people to this day that are like, ah, eh, that apneic oxygenation stuff is stupid. Why are you putting a, a nasal cannula on somebody who is not even moving their lungs? They're not breathing. It's not going to do anything. But then you look at there's a there's a humongous body of evidence that says that it does work. Now, will you will you move CO2 out? No. In that one old study, subject number seven, his CO2 got up to 250. Poor number seven. Yeah, poor number seven. And he, But here's <laughs> the thing. He, he was under, he was apneic for 55 minutes. And you know what happened to him? He came out and he was fine. Nothing. Nothing, <laughs> Nothing really happened to him. A couple of them have some PVCs. Um, they don't know if that was related to the apnea or not, but most of these subjects, and it's been reproduced that you can have people apneic for quite a while, uh, as long as they're not going to code from, you know, hypercapnia or something like that. We know that people who, for example, have high meta, uh, metabolic acidosis caused by anion gaps, the DKA patient, they don't tolerate apnea, right? There are certain patients that don't tolerate apnea. doesn't mean you shouldn't still provide them with, with oxygenation. Sure. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it really is a great study and it, it does, it, it just makes good sense, especially if you have a, an understanding of these, um, of these gas laws, which, you know, I think it's, it's great that you've, that you've put this together, you know, the, the two blog series with the, with a couple of podcasts, because I think it's really kind of a good hack for people that are maybe struggling with anatomy physiology, because if you understand uh, the basics of how these things work, then this applies to a lot of different areas in the body and a lot of different things that you're trying to, uh, trying to sort out. And, you know, it just makes good sense, the apneic oxygenation, because we talked about how if you create a gradient for flow, it, it's going to, it's going to flow, uh, because it wants to move from high concentration to low concentration. So if you're constantly washing out the oral pharynx with that high flow oxygen, you're, you're maintaining that, that larger amount of oxygen up here. So it's going to, it's going to take it further down into the airway through, uh, effusion and, you know, that, that turbulent flow that you spoke about. And that, uh, is also kind of covered a little bit in the Heliox, um, mm -hmm. uh, 
the Heliox article that you're going to reference in this as well, uh, where they talk about laminar versus uh, turbulent flow, where that laminar flow stops when we you know stop breathing, and now that turbulent flow is going to continue, and that that drop in pressure that we experience as that effusion continues to happen, diffusion down the concentration gradient, it just makes good sense. Yeah, I I love when you know people think it's this new thing, and then you look back. And it's been going on for about 60 years. <laughs> you know, we've yeah. been we've been playing with this for for quite some time, but it's been, I guess, repopularized. Maybe it was always popular in anesthesia and we didn't know. But, you know, it, we kind of get things a little late in the game sometimes in, in emergency care. So it's, it's definitely useful and uh, it, it's not as useful in patients that have bad pulmonary shunt. So if you got somebody who's, um, you know, got really bad pulmonary edema and you're holding it open with PEEP, it comes back to fix law that that uh stack of what that oxygen has to get through as soon as you withdraw that peep that that stack is going to get really thick and so is it going to work really well in patients that have pulmonary shunt no that the benefit is not nearly as good as somebody without pulmonary shunt without a bunch of crap in their lungs that's going to collapse as soon as you take positive pressure off but would I, am I going to differentiate in emergency care and say, oh, this patient's got their, their pulmonary shunts too bad. I'm not even, I'm not even going to use apneic oxygen. No, I'm probably just going to do it the same way every single time and assume that more oxygen is better when I'm trying to not have my patient desaturate down to 20. So <laughs> that's yeah, probably a good sure. thing. So, um, the other one that we talked about was Dalton's and Amagat's and I mostly threw it in there because I had a question on my FPC about this where they asked me, what is the partial pressure of, of oxygen given regular air at this pressure? And I threw an example question into the blog so that people know how to do that simple formula. But you guys use this in diving for more than just book smarts and passing a test. So this actually, this actually changes how you guys prepare for a dive. Oh yeah, yeah. It has uh, it has some definite real world applications, and so for testing purposes, it's it's really simple. Dalton's law simply says that a gas uh, alone will act uh, with the same amount of uh, pressure as it would in a mixture. So it's like saying uh, you've got a you know you've got a team that can do all of these things together, and then you take those team members and you divide them up, and they all would add up to make uh, to make that team essentially. Um, so we know that a gas exerts a pressure within a mixture. So for instance, oxygen, uh, in normal air, we would call that 21% or 0.21. So if you had to calculate it, it'd be whatever pressure you're at. So let's say 760 for easy, uh, mm -hmm. multiply that by 0.21. That gives you your pressure of oxygen at, uh, atmospheric level at the, at the surface. Um, so where we utilize that is we know there's one atmosphere that's pushing down on the water all the time. Every 33 feet that we descend, we add another atmosphere. So for instance, oxygen, it becomes toxic at a certain partial pressure. We try ne to never exceed 1.6. Now it starts at 0.21, right? At the surface. If we descend 33 feet, now it's 0.42. If we descend 33 more feet, it's 0.2. Six three, and that's about as far as I can go in my head. <laughs> but, um, you see, you see the concept there. Every yeah. atmosphere we're adding point uh, two one because we're stacking another atmosphere on top of that, and it's adding to the pressure that that oxygen is going to exert. And uh, Dalton's law, of partial pressures, tells us that that oxygen will exert that pressure uh, the same alone as it would within a mixture. So it does have some. It does have some real world applications to us and we need to be able to calculate that. Something else that we can do that's kind of cool. We talked about how nitrogen is a narcotic, right? And mm -hmm. we don't want that to happen underwater for what I hope are obvious reasons. Um, so, I, you know, I can tell what I, let's say what I feel like at 99 feet or three atmospheres of water and one from the surface. Um, and let's say I want to feel that same way when I'm at 250 feet. Well, if I calculate the partial pressure of nitrogen at 99 feet, and then I add enough helium into the mix to offset nitrogen so that the nitrogen partial pressure is the same at that deeper depth, then I will feel the same at that deeper depth. It's mm -hmm. called an equivalent narcotic depth or END. 
So it's pretty cool. We can calculate a lot of these things. Um, and Amagats is just basically the same thing, but it's the, the amount of, uh, you know, the, the amount of that gas. Um, so we use that where we would calculate like a surface air consumption. So I know how much air I consume at the surface. And then I can add an atmosphere to that every time I descend 33 feet. So at, uh, you know, 66 feet, my breath is going the same to fill my lungs the same amount as it would take at the surface. I'm going to need three times as much gas coming out of that tank. So this way we can calculate how, how much time that we have on a tank at a given depth based on those pressures. So it's kind of cool. Yeah. And, and bringing it back to one of the ones that we talked a little bit about last time, but was in the last blog was Avogadro's law. And that basically says for, for a given volume, you've got a given amount of moles of that gas. And so if you have to get the same volume, you're going to get the same moles out of there. So they're, they're all connected. And so once you kind of get the, you get the sense of these laws, you start to see how everything is connected and you can make very real world applications with them with, with diving people who are, you know, going high up in altitude are going to make applications going the reverse way. Uh, with when they're going up in high altitudes and you'll see that every every one of these laws it kind of hints at the other one but if you can bring a lot of them together and say here's an example of this law here's an example of this law you'll start to say hey that you know that piece is borrowed from over here for example in the blog when i talked about fixed law one of the things that affects the ability to go through that membrane is actually the size of the molecule or the density or the weight or however you want to think about that. But then you and I just talked about that in relation to Graham's law and said, if that molecule is really small, it'll have an easier time going through, you know, a passageway, for example, a fusion, for example, a glottic opening, or for example, you know, going through an AC membrane. And so then that connects those. And then you bring in Dalton's law and it comes into the partial pressure of how many, how much gas is in each one. And you say, Okay, well, if I'm something's effusing, uh, you have nitrogen and oxygen, um, or for example, CO2 and, and oxygen, which one's going to diffuse faster? It's going to be the oxygen because oxygen is just CO2 without a carbon in the middle. So that's going to go faster. And then the partial pressure of that gas affects how fast it goes. So it's like everything is so super connected. And I think when I first started learning about these gas laws, it, it, I felt like I was learning all these different gas laws. And it is important to be able to pick them apart and say, Here's where this one isolates this stuff. And here's where, you know, this one over here does the same thing. But really, if you just look at ventilation, oxygenation, CO2 elimination, they're all at play at one time. And once some of that stuff starts to click in there, if whether you guys are taking an, an exam for FPC, CCPC, CFRN, whatever you're doing, or you're trying to just improve the way you know how to oxygenate and ventilate people, once that stuff starts clicking, um, all the treatments that we do start to make a lot more sense. So, okay. and it just helps you because you can process through things when you have those complex patients uh, mm -hmm. or complex uh, test questions that you're trying to deal with. Mm -hmm. uh, understanding the physiology just allows you to think through things, and yeah, I definitely can can process map things much easier if I understand the basics of what's going on. Yeah, I totally agree. Well, um, why don't you give us? You're going to be out of town next week at FDIC, and so give us a, yeah. a plug for for what you're doing there, and then the podcast too. Yeah, so next week I'll be teaching uh, teaching at FDIC Monday, Tuesday. We've got a hands-on training class, uh, active shooter response for the first two companies. And then I'll be attending the conference the, the remainder of the week. So if you're down there and you want to get together, maybe put a face with a name, uh, feel free to email me, mike at foamfrat.com. I'd love to maybe get to meet some of you. Uh, the podcast that Sam alluded to, other than this podcast, Another one that I'd really like you to check out is the RSI podcast, Rapid Sequence Interrogation, hosted by myself and Jared Patterson. Uh, we take questions submitted from the internet, try to answer them in kind of a rapid fire sort of uh, sort of scenario. So we try to move through them fairly quickly and get uh, some different topics covered. So what I'd like you to do is go to the Foam Pratt website while you're over there checking out the refresher. Uh, when you need a little break from looking at that, just click on the RSI podcast tab that's up at the top. You can submit a question to Jared and I, and we will get it. Uh, we will get it answered for you. It can be any type of question that you want, uh, and then you can feel free to return back to checking out the uh, checking out the foam frat refresher. 
But Sam, I appreciate you having me on. Thank you. Thanks for coming, man. Thanks for the thanks for the plug for our refresher. And uh, I actually am giving a talk on these gas laws, and and Mike has some um, that he covers as well, as far as like dive medicine and stuff. And uh, I put it at the bottom of the blog. I believe I'm looking at my calendar right now. I think it's uh, August 18th. I think it's August 18th. I'm giving a a talk on these gas laws, kind of a general overview of some of these and applications. So be sure to tune into that. And yeah, thanks for coming, man. Thanks for having me.